All right, mix, you guys good? Yeah. Woo, I love it, I love it, I love it. Let me ask you this question, all right? Have you ever been in a scenario where you were completely outnumbered? Have you had that happen to you? Okay, all right, let me tell you about my story here, okay? I was in seventh grade. Where are my seventh graders at? Okay. I was in seventh grade, middle school, and I remember I was in gym class. And in uh, our gym class, when class was over, uh, we had to hit the lockers, okay? You had to change out your gym clothes back into your school clothes. That's just the way we did it in the seventh grade. Now, I remember I was in the, the locker room, and here's the thing. Uh, seventh grade, I was just, you know, I was just little, okay? I was just little. And I'll never forget that day. Seventh grade gym class, I was in the locker room, and for some reason, this one kid just kept picking on me. He just kept picking on me, picking on me, and picking on me, and then his friends started picking on me, and so class was over, and I'm just like, I want to just get changed and get out of there, but I will never forget, seventh grade locker room after gym class, I was cornered in the locker by Big Billy Preston. Mm -hmm. Now... Here's the deal. When I say Big Billy, here's the thing. I'm not talking like, I'm not talking like he was like his size. I'm not saying like he was like a, a bigger person. I'm talking about, do you know that kid in seventh grade that looks like a full-grown adult? Okay, that's Big Billy, okay? I mean, he's, he was called Big Billy because he looked like a man, all right? He had a beard in seventh grade. And I remember I was getting picked on all gym class. I was in the locker room trying to change and get out of there. Big Billy Preston and his friends all cornered me, and I didn't know what to do. They kind of like, they kind of got between me and the door. And now here's the thing, I'm a little guy, you know. But hey, Big Billy, you want it. You could catch these hands, you know what I'm saying? Because I wasn't a Christian yet, all right? And so, like, I was cornered in this, the locker room, and here's the thing. I was so little, he was so big, I didn't want to fight. But I didn't want him to know that I didn't want to fight. And so the only way that I knew how to get out of a fight was just to act crazy. <laughs> and so I just got a little tick going, you know. I was like, are you talking to me, Big Billy? You talking to me, you know? And then my, my thought was, I, okay, I, I can't, like, back down, and I can't yell, like, mommy or something like that, but I definitely need help. So I'm like, I'm just going to get loud. <laughs> that was my plan. I'm going to get loud. And so I was like, oh, Big Billy, you want to fight me right now in the locker room? <laughs> I hope nobody breaks this up because I want to throw. And then the gym teacher came running, running in, saved me. I was like, oh, praise the Lord. You know, because like, I didn't want to fight because I was going to lose. And now I don't know if you've ever been in a, hopefully you've never been in a fight. And hopefully you've never been in a scenario like that. But here's the deal. When you are outnumbered, when you are outnumbered, that feels like your only option. Fighting feels like your only option. Now, what I want to do with my time tonight is I want to show you a, 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 like an account in the Bible. We've been learning about the life of Elijah, you know, all week long. You're going to hear about him more as the week goes on. But here in the Bible, in the smack dab middle of the Bible, we get this glimpse of Elijah's life where he is in that same scenario, completely outnumbered. And, and, and it seems like he might have to fight, but it's so cool to see what God does in his life and how God shows up. So do this with me. If you have a Bible with you or a Bible app or whatever you guys use to read your Bible, get that out, open it up to the book of 1 Kings, okay? 1 Kings, we're going to be in the Bible. Chapter 18 is where we're going to be for our time. And I just want to read this account to you. Because I believe, even as middle schoolers, you know, 6th, 7th, 8th graders, if you could wrap your head around what's happening here in the Old Testament of the Bible, and you could think about how it applies to your life, I believe this one section of Scripture literally can change your life. 1 Kings chapter 18, and let me set the scene for you while you're turning there. Elijah is about to have this throwdown. This prophet of the Lord, Obadiah, has kind of found him. And, and, and you guys learned about King Ahab, right? You guys learned about this king? Yeah, he's literally like the worst king ever, right? I think of him as the nickelback of kings, okay? Nobody likes the dude. And so he's the king, and, and, and he is like so upset, and his wife Jezebel wants to kill all the people who honor God. 
And so Elijah shows up, and it's looking like it's going to be a fight. Now, here's the thing. Elijah is going to be completely outnumbered. Look what it says. If you have your Bible open, 1 Kings chapter 18, pick it up, verse 19. I'll read it to you if you don't have it, but it says this. Now, so, now this is Elijah talking, and he's talking to you know, the, this, this king, and he's saying, like, here's, what, here's how it's going to go down. Look what he says. Now, summon the people from all over Israel to meet on Mount Carmel and bring 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Elijah's showing up on this mountain, Mount Carmel, and he says, we're about to have a throwdown. We're about to have a throwdown. And, he, and I love what he says. He says, I want you to get every person who worships a different God than our God. I want you to get the 450 prophets of this God named Baal. I want you to get the 400 prophets of this God named Asherah. And I alone, one person, I'm going to represent the true God. And we're going to see what happens. Here's what I love about that. Do the math. 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah, that's 850 people against one. 850 against one. I like to think Elijah was like, oh, we got a problem here? You know, like, I like to think he was getting a little tick in him, trying to get a little crazy, but 850 against one. Okay, here's the truth about me, and I'm I'm not proud of this fact, but I'll share it with you. I have never won a game of Fortnite ever, (laughs) ever. Has anybody here ever won Fortnite? Oh, how? It's impossible. Okay, here's the deal. Here's the deal. That's 99 against one. Keep, all right, for those of you who have played that game before, that's 99 against one. Elijah is facing 850 people in the final circle. And he looks like he's about to fight these people. But here's what's awesome. Elijah, inspired by God, he decides this. You know what? We're not going to have a fist fight up here today. We're not going to have a fist fight. No, no, no. We're going to have a faith off. And Elijah's going to say, look, I want you to ask your God to show up. And then I'm going to ask my God to show up. And I love the way Elijah says it because he's going to say, And whoever does, that's who's going to win. Even though Elijah's completely outnumbered, he's not going to fight. Even though he's completely outnumbered, he's going to hold on to his faith. Even though he's completely outnumbered and the masses are worshiping other gods in other ways, and they're calling him foolish, and they're calling him wrong, and they're calling him too traditional or old ways or whatever, these people are looking down on him. He is not backing down from it. He is standing up for God. And I think that's so powerful. In fact, look forward ahead at verse 21. Skip ahead a couple verses in your Bible. Look at 21. And I love what Elijah says because it says so much about who God is. Look at 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. And here's what I love about that verse. Elijah is not trying to debate anybody into believing in God. Elijah is not trying to force anybody to believe in God. Elijah is basically saying this. Is your God working for you? Is your way of life working for you? Are the choices you're making, the the way that you're living, the things you're prioritizing, are they really helping you get what you want? Because if they are, then I'll gladly follow your way of life. But If they're not, would you please try my God? Try my way. And I think about that for you and me today. Because, you know, we're not going to go on a mountain, you know, around here. You're not going to go into, you know, this combative kind of situation that Elijah is in. But every single day that you step foot in your schools, for many of you, when you set foot in your family, You are outnumbered by the number of people who do not worship God versus you who may know God. And it may be tempting to try to prove your faith. It may be tempting to try to, you know, force someone else to believe. It may be tempting to try to debate someone into 
understanding who God is. But Elijah is just going to ask a simple question. Is your way working? And if not, would you try my way? And I think for you and me, that may be a better way. A better way to share our faith. A better way to interact with people who are far from God. In fact, here's the question I would want you to think about on your mind right now in this moment. As I finish the rest of this talk, here's the question I want you to think about. Who in your life is close to you but far from God? Who in your life likes you, knows you, enjoys being around you, but they're far from God because they don't know him? They don't know him like you do. And for some of you, that person may be you. Maybe you're here today, this week at, at Mix, because you came with a family member or a friend, and you came, and you're starting to hear about Jesus, and you're starting to hear about God, and you're starting to hear about how he moves in his people to this day. And maybe some of you are close to your friend, but you yourself are far from God. For Elijah, he's just going to say, even for you, is your way working? Do you have joy, fulfillment, completion in life? And if not, would you follow my God? So the ground is set. The faith off is about to begin. These 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah, they're going to set up an altar. They're going to put you know, this animal sacrifice on the altar. And Elijah's going to say, just ask God to send fire. If your God sends fire on this altar, we'll worship him. And so they go for it. They start, they start, you know, praying to their false gods. They start, you know, you know making this big show of it. They start, the Bible tells us they even start, like, whipping themselves and hurting themselves because God's not answering. In fact, I love, like, in the middle of it, Elijah starts, you know, the Bible says that he taunts them. But, like, you know, we all know what's up. He's just throwing some shade, right? Like, I love Elijah starts thinking, well, maybe you need to be louder. Maybe, you're, maybe your God's asleep. And these people are trying so hard so hard to get what they want but they're not doing it in the way that the true god can intervene and what i love about this account in first kings chapter 18 is then after they get exhausted it says that they prayed all day think about what you've done today think about since you woke up since you had breakfast since you came to morning session, since you went to free time, since you, since you ate dinner, since you've come back here, think about how long your day has been. The Bible tells us here in, in 1 Kings 18 that that whole time, an entire day, the prophets of Baal and Asher were crying out, God, save us, God, light this, light this altar, and nothing happened from their false God. But look what happens when Elijah prays to our God. Skip ahead now to verse 36. Elijah has let them go all day long, trying to do it their way. And Elijah's going to say, what if there's a better way? And I love it, because look what happens. It's not a fight initially. Look what it says. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward, and he prayed. Elijah prayed. He doesn't yell. He doesn't whip himself. He doesn't put on the big show. He doesn't, he doesn't debate. He doesn't fight. He doesn't, he just, initially the first thing he does is he prays. And look at his prayer. Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all of these things at your command. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so that these people will know that you are Lord, that you, Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Guys, I think that is the most important part of this message. That when there are people who are close to you and far from God, I don't think God wants us initially to fight them. I don't think God wants you to feel like they are your enemies just because they're missing who God is, just because they're missing what God can do in their life. Here's what you need to know. People are not your enemies. People who think differently than you, people who act differently than you, who prioritize differently than you, 
they're not necessarily your enemy. They may be led astray by Satan, and they're hurting, and they need help and hope. And I believe what, what they need is someone to stand up and show them a different way. Show them a different way that leads to hope. Show them a different way that leads to purpose. Show them a different way that leads to joy. Show them a different way that leads to getting the results that they want. These prophets of Baal and Asherah prayed their whole day and nothing happened. And I wonder how many of your friends, they'll go on social media all day looking for meaning in life. They'll, 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 they'll drown out you know, you know, hours into video games because they don't want to deal with maybe what's happening at school or in life and their family. I wonder how many of your friends are just trying to find fulfillment in so many different things. When if you are here today and you know the Lord, you have a powerful tool to change the lives of the people around you. And it's not your fists. It's not your, your brain to debate. Look what Elijah does. He prays. Let me ask you this. When is the last time, when you're thinking about that person who's close to you but far from God, when is the last time you prayed for their salvation? You prayed that God would reveal himself to them and that their heart could be softened to see God and that they themselves can come to know the one true God. What I love about Elijah in this account on Mount Carmel is that he didn't have to fight. He just had to be faithful. And I believe that is still true to this day. I truly do. I believe many of you in this room who know God, you want your parents to know him as well. You want your siblings to know him as well. You want your teachers and your family members and your neighbors to know him as well. But I'm, I, but I'm telling you, the best way to do that is probably not fighting them. But probably a better way is praying for them and asking God to show up. Elijah says, God, light this altar. Not for me, but for the benefit of those who will see that you are real. And I think that is the kind of prayer that we need to pray today. God, show up in my life. Not to fight you know, them, but to show them your love and way. I love the way Exodus 8, 14, 14 says this. It says that you and I need only be still and allow the Lord to fight for us. And I feel the idea of being still. Because being still often, yeah, it means you don't have to be the one fighting. But you know what be still also means? Don't run. Don't run. When people realize that your life is different, when people realize that your priorities are different, when people realize that you love the Lord and they start questioning you or challenging you, and maybe they're outnumbering you, when the number of people in your school who don't know God look at your life and say, why don't you listen to the music we listen to? Why don't you date the way that we date? Why don't you prioritize, you know, fun the way that we, these type of things? I think you should be able to say, you know what, I'm standing for the Lord. I'm not being aggressive towards you, but I'm not going to retreat either. Because I know that God is real and is really with me. In fact, what I love about 1 Kings 18 is it kind of like bookends in the book of the Bible called Romans. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, this is what the Apostle Paul is going to say. It's interesting because it's right along the same lines. Paul is going to say this to you and me. He says, don't conform to the patterns of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And basically he's saying like, whenever you're outnumbered, if you're outnumbered at school, if you're outnumbered in your home, whenever you are outnumbered, don't conform to what they're doing. Don't just give in because there's a lot of them. Hold to your faith. Hold to your convictions. Hold to your belief and pray for them so that through your faith, some may be saved. And I believe that. I believe in this room right now, not only is salvation available to any one of you who does not know the loving grace of Jesus Christ, I believe some of you here today are going to leave 
this camp and you're going to go home and salvation is going to come through you and to your parents and to your siblings and to your teachers when school starts and into your community if you don't conform to the masses just because they outnumber you and you hold firm to your faith. Now, here's the thing. With Elijah, it's so cool because it looks like there's going to be a fight, but he doesn't want to fight, and then he prays, and then literally fire comes down from heaven. How cool is that? Fire from heaven. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, matches were like my favorite toy. I'm not proud of that, and I don't recommend it. But something about just fire was fun. And here's Elijah. He just prays, and it says, fire comes down from heaven. I want to do that, okay? I want to call some fire down from heaven. That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it just be cool to just be like, hey, you want to know if God's real? Watch this. <laughs> like, just, like, just like human torch type. That'd be awesome, right? Here's what Romans 12 is going to say. Watch this. Romans 12 is going to say, you and I, we can still call fire down to this day. When you go to the end of Romans 12, and this is why it bookends so well with Elijah's story on Mount Carmel, because God's going to say this. Romans chapter 12, verse 20, he's going to tell us that if your enemy is hungry, feed them. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Because in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Meaning this, if you want to call fire down on someone who is close to you but far from God, the way that we do that today is we love them well. We love them well. Guys, Jesus Christ came to this earth after Elijah has prepared this way of faith. And many people thought Jesus was like the second Elijah. That's what they, they, they thought because they like, he was so amazing. He was doing these miracles, but he was greater than Elijah. And what Elijah kind of started on this mountain in Carmel of showing that God is real and really moving in this world, Jesus is going to bring to its fullness. And what I love what Jesus says is the same way Elijah called down fire on his altar, I want you to call down fire burning coals, but the way that you do that is loving people well, loving everyone well. You don't have to debate them. You don't have to fight them. You just have to love them. In fact, I read a book this year. It was great. It was, so, it was called Everybody Always, and, and the book was about who should we love as Christians, and the book literally says everybody always, because when you love people, you lead people to the Lord. And so in this book, what it said was, it was so great. It said, here's what you need to do. If you want to know how to live for Jesus, what you need to do is draw a circle around you. In fact, let's do this. Can you do me a favor? Let's do this together. Could you guys all stand up? Everybody stand up. Stand up. All right. This is going to get a little awkward. It's going to get a little awkward. But do this with me, okay? Hands straight out. Straight out. All right, now, okay, stay with me, okay, stay with me, watch this, okay, watch this, okay, stay with me, slowly, slowly, gently, and appropriately, here we go, I want you to take one turn, full turn, full turn, All right, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. Hopefully, hopefully. Hopefully. Hopefully when you turned around, your hands hit somebody, okay? Here's what Jesus is going to say. Guys, here's what Jesus is going to say. If you want to call fire down today, the way kind of Elijah did, you don't have to fight people. You need to love everyone. And here's what he's going to say. Think about this space. Think about this circle around you. 
And here's what you do. From this day to your last day on this earth, any human being who steps inside this circle, any human being that you can touch, Jesus is going to say, love them. Love them. And if you love them, then that is the way you will lead them to me. Guys, I was at a camp just like this many years ago. Just like you, some of you, maybe you're here and, and you love the Lord. I, but I was like maybe some of you who are here not right now, I didn't know the Lord. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I wasn't raised going to church. And I remember sitting in a, a camp just like this, and God got a hold of my heart. And I remember learning that with the power of the Holy Spirit, that God gives us the power to stand up for him in this world. But when we say God gives you the power to stand up, it's, it's not for you to fight. God gives you the power to stand up and to stand firm and to love people well. And when I was thinking about who was close to me and far from God, it was my stepdad. My stepdad did not know the Lord. My stepdad did not want to know the Lord. I remember I got home from camp and I gave my life to Jesus at CIY just like this. And I got home and I just wanted to tell my stepdad about Jesus. But he didn't want to hear it. He thought I joined a cult. He thought I was brainwashed. I was outnumbered in my home with all the people who did not love God. And here I am, just the one member of my family, the only member of my family who loved the Lord. And I'll be honest with you, I was tempted to try to fight them. I was tempted to point out every mistake they were making, every bad thing they were doing, everything that they were, you know, in their life that was not honoring God. But then I remembered, they're just trying to find happiness. They're just trying to find meaning. They're trying to find hope. And they don't know how. So I looked at my stepdad like these prophets of Baal, just screaming and flailing and just trying to find his way through life. And I knew, even as a young kid, that I had something that he needed. But I knew I couldn't force him. And I definitely couldn't fight him to become a man of faith. So you know what I did? I loved him. When I got home, I took my love to a whole new level. When they said, get off, you know, time to be off your video games, I just stopped. I didn't throw a fit because I wanted to show them self-control that we talk about in the book of Galatians. When they talked about, you know, uh, not getting a fight with my brother, I, I, I said, okay, I, I will admit my flaws because I just wanted to show them that I was capable of repentance and realizing that I am a sinner. When they would talk to me about, you know, all these things, I just wanted to just love them and show them that I was serious about my faith. And here's the thing, guys. It wasn't overnight. It didn't happen in a year. It took some time. But over the course of a few years of me living out my faith, standing firm in my faith, though I was outnumbered, standing firm in my faith, they saw, they saw that God was real to me. And they wanted him to be real for them. They saw the fire in my heart. And they wanted that as well. And guys, I cannot tell you I hope some of you get to experience what I did. Seeing your step-parent get baptized into Jesus Christ because of your faith and your faithfulness to not give in and not fight, but stand firm in your faith. God's going to give you the power to stand up, but you have to be willing to stand there. And guys, here's why this matters. This is why this matters so much, and this is why I leave my family, and I come to places like this to talk to people like you. Because that person who's close to you, and who is far from God, and who's looking for salvation, but they might not be able to find it without your faith, that person's soul needs Jesus. Guys, Mix is an amazing event. But please understand, this is not just about skits 
and songs and sermons. What's happening this week is literally about eternity. It's about your salvation and the salvation of other souls around you. And it matters. About eight years after my stepfather accepted the Lord, unfortunately he had a tragic accident and he passed very unexpectedly. death had no sting that day because he, he knew that salvation was available to him through Jesus and we knew that his faith was sufficient for eternity so when I say who's close to you but far from God I want you to know that that person's soul matters to God and your faith may be the very vehicle that God wants to use to show him that he is real and really moves in this world. And let me just say this. If it's you, if you're in this room and you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, what is stopping you? What is stopping you from allowing God to light a fire in your heart, a flame that shines bright, that then you can become an instrument of salvation, not just for yourself, but for others as well. God tells us he will give you the power to stand up, stand firm in your faith. And by doing so, he will use you to help others find the Lord. Elijah did it on that mountain. And I believe God is still calling us to do it today. Don't conform to the masses. Stand firm to your faith. Wide is the road that's going to lead people to destruction. But narrow, narrow is the way of those who know the Lord. And they find eternity. And my prayer for you is that you then, who are on that path with love, will lead others with you. Let's pray, and let's think about who is close to us and far from God. Father God, I come before you, and Lord, I pray, I pray right now for the souls of these young men and women in this room. God, I specifically say these young men and women because, God, that's who they are. These are your church. These are your children. And these children, have people in their life who are in jeopardy of hell. And God, I know, I know you could use even the faith of these to bring salvation to those. So Father, I pray, I pray for your Holy Spirit to be in this room. I pray for any who have not accepted you, Father, tonight would be a night that they not be able to deny your love anymore. And Father, for those who do have your spirit, I pray that they would shine for those close to them who need to know your love and your grace. Father, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.